The Saints go over 500 for the first time in four years with a completely insane win over the Lions. The next few weeks are looking good too. Plus, LSU rallies for a 20-point comeback win over Auburn. Tulane ends up with a head-scratching loss at Florida International. And we preview the Pelican season with Game 1 tipping off on Wednesday. This is the last word on sports. Fourth down on four starts now. We can now call it a win streak. What up? Welcome to fourth down on four. I'm Ricardo LaCoff. The Saints moved their record to over 500 for the first time in four seasons. Thanks to their third straight win today. And it came in a very wild and very entertaining game against the Lions. Andrew Doak recaps today's contest at the Mercedes Benz Superdome. Over the last three weeks, the Saints defense has fueled the resurgence for this team. When's the last time you remember being able to say that? The game ended up being much closer than I think it needed to be based upon the way our defense was playing. You know, they, they, they played lights out, um, but, I, you know, it's one of those where you walk away from it, glad we got the win. The Saints defense forced five turnovers and scored a franchise record three defensive touchdowns. And now they put themselves in position to change the narrative. The narrative that's been created by three straight seven and nine teams. That's what we've been missing as a team. You know, we've always had a potent offense. We've always had an offense that's going to put up 30 plus points a game. Um, and our defense is finally playing with how they should be. Um, and this game was rolling. But the defense wasn't the only thing starting to snowball in a positive way. The Saints had more rushing yards than passing yards for the first time since 2009. Mark Ingram and Alvin Kamara combined for 237 yards from scrimmage, confirming the Saints will be just fine without Adrian Peterson. Just for us to be able to, you know, have that camaraderie, me and Alvin be able to play with each other, uh, very complement each other well. Um, we, we, we wanted to take advantage of the opportunity. I'd love to have that player, but it's hard to have that many in, in get into rhythm. I thought Mark and, and, and Alvin had some big plays and I would, would hope to have thought that we would have had that type of rushing output uh, if Adrian was part of it. But what they've also found is resolve and heart, which is one of the toughest things to measure. And instead of running from the storm after the start they had, they ran towards it. You have a chance to either fold up and cry about it or you can come to work and try and turn this turn the ship around, turn it the right way. I think we're all just playing as one right now. You know, we're trying to, we're trying to complement each other, you know, offense, defense, and special teams, you know, and uh, when you go out and you have a ball game like we had today, you know, and you can see both, everybody really contributing to it. For the first time since 2013, the Saints are above 500. Some players didn't even know it had been that long. But the win was most important because of the schedule that lies ahead. Green Bay will now be without their quarterback, Aaron Rodgers. Chicago, who's next on deck, has a rookie quarterback. And then the Saints host a Tampa Bay team that's gotten off to a sluggish start just like themselves. So the Saints have an opportunity to make up ground, especially in the playoff chase. For us, we don't want to be a yo-yo team. I mean, since I've been here, it's win one, lose one, win two, lose three in a row, you know? so. For us to be three wins in a row, I think it's big, um, but you're always good at your next win. You asked me at the end of the season where we're at, and I'll be able to tell you uh, truthfully how, how I feel. Um, I'm, I'm trying, like I said, I'm trying not to be overly elated about our win right now. Um, we got to focus. We got to turn this into a 24 hour rule um, come Monday. We're rolling. We're rolling right now. We got some momentum. Um, we got meetings tomorrow to uh, critique and correct some mistakes we made late. And uh, we got to go up to Green Bay and get a big one. It's a huge game. Huge game. We need it. At the Superdome, Andrew Doak, fourth down on four. Thanks, Andrew. Today was the first time the Saints defense has ever scored three touchdowns in one game. And it was the first time since 2011 that any NFL team has done that. The most defensive touchdowns the Saints D has scored in a single season is nine. That was back in 1998. With more analysis from the Dome. Once again, here's Andrew Doak. All right, what a win it was for the Saints having to hold on for dear life here at the Superdome, joined by Nick Underhill of The Advocate. They're back over 500 for the first time since 2013. It almost feels fitting that it had to come this way to really be able to claw one out to be able to finally get over that hump. Well, only the Saints could take what should have been the high point of the last few seasons and bring it right to the brink of maybe being catastrophic. But they clawed it out. They did get the win. 
and they are over 500 for the first time in what seems like forever. And that just has to be a big step for this team, even mentally. They've gotten to four and four each of the last three years. I know some of the guys are new and haven't been around for that, but, but for the guys who have, it kind of gets you out of this pattern of, okay, we can get to this point, but here we go again, and it's going to spiral out of control. So I think things are setting up well for them. Aaron Rodgers goes down, so now that's a, a winnable game, and the schedule softens up from there. So I think the Saints have set themselves up well to change the narrative, the 7-9 and nine over and over narrative. So it, it, it's a big game for them. No, exactly. I mean, like you said, I don't want to get ahead of myself either, but you, you look at the schedule like you're saying. I mean, you have Green Bay without Aaron Rodgers. You have Chicago with the rookie quarterback. Tampa Bay, an NFC South opponent, comes in. You feel like you have a, a really good opportunity to maybe get to 6-2, and 5-3. and three. Is, is that what you kind of see in your mind? Yeah, and, you know, I, I'm jaded. I've been here since 2014, so I'm always cautious about this team because they bring you to this point where there is this optimism. But this year, I, I do feel like it's a little bit different. They're a more talented team. Those first two weeks of the season, they, they were losing because they weren't executing. It didn't matter what Sam Bradford did, what Tom Brady did. It was their coverage. It, you know, P.J. Williams is biting on a play action and getting beat for 60 yards. It was things like that happening. And they've tightened up a little bit. There, there's still some things they're going to want to clean up. Their third downs weren't great today. But this team is playing better. They're creating opportunities. They're getting turnover sacks. These are all things that didn't happen the last three seasons. So it feels a lot different this year. It still feels like a, a bin but don't break defense. But I mean, even right before halftime, they had that fourth and goal stop where they were able to, to keep uh, Detroit out of the end zone. They forced nine turnovers on the day. Uh, I'm sorry, five turnovers on the day, but nine in the last three games. Where, where do you think the confidence has come to be able to create, the, create these extra opportunities for their offense throughout the last three games, starting with Carolina? I think just doing it and seeing it happen. It's just, you know, they, they weren't getting bounces of the ball before. It, it was weird just how long they would go without creating a turnover. And now it seems like the balls are they're finding guys, which is a lot different. And you can be Ben, but don't break. The 2011 Patriots made the Super Bowl allowing 6,500 yards of offense, but only allowed 20 points per game. So if you get teams down into the red zone, you clamp down, get that stop or get that turnover. You know, that, that's a formula that works, and it seems like it's working for this team. So, you know, as long as it keeps going, it, it's okay if, you know, every now and then there, there's a big play. Thanks, Nick and Andrew. Coming up, we'll head to Baton Rouge, where a number of huge plays help LSU take down Auburn after being down 20 in the first half. And Tulane struggled on both sides of the ball on the road at Florida International. And later, we'll break down what the injury to Rajon Rondo does for the Pelicans as they begin the season on Wednesday. What a difference two weeks make. A fortnight ago, LSU hit rock bottom. A home loss to Troy and head coach Ed Ogeron placed right on the hot seat. But a tough road win at Florida, followed by a historic victory Saturday night against rival Auburn, has the Tigers on the rise once again. The moment the 2007 LSU Tigers will never forget hoisting the crystal ball after beating Ohio State in the BCS title game. That same team got to witness another great moment in program history Saturday at Tiger Stadium when the 2017 Tigers staged the biggest SEC comeback at home since 1949. We could feel their spirit. It started with the Tiger Walk, a couple of them were in the hotel. They were all over the place in here, man. We welcomed them back. Uh, we were playing for them today. and. Uh, what a tremendous honor to have those guys with us today. But the Tigers unfortunately came out flat in front of them early on. Auburn jumped out to a quick 10-0 lead three minutes and 29 seconds into the game. The lead increased to 17-0 after the first. Auburn scoring more points in the opening quarter, 17, than LSU plays ran, 12. Well, let me say this to you. This is a good football team, and they've exploded on everybody in the first quarter. Uh, they've annihilated some people in the first half. And... Uh, we, we were resilient, we kept on playing. The visiting Tigers led 20 to nothing before the home Tigers finally woke up. And just before the end of the first half, LSU scored on a great diving grab by Russell Gage. The Tigers grabbing a bit of momentum, heading into the locker room. And all we said on the sideline, all they kept saying was we need a stop and a score. Went into halftime, we got some momentum to come out. Defense is playing lights out. And then DJ Chark strikes. <laughs> Oh, man. The senior wide receiver sparking the Tigers early in the fourth quarter. DJ Chark, who racked up 230 all-purpose yards, housed a 75-yard punt return for a touchdown, a play that ignited the Tigers. 
I knew I could catch it without fair catching it. So I caught it, was able to uh, move a little bit to the left, make a miss. At that point, I just saw everything open up, guys hustling, getting on blocks. And at that point, you know, like I said, those guys wanted a big play, and even though the ball wasn't in their hand, it was going to make the big play happen. So at that point, I knew it was a touchdown. On the other side, the LSU defense clamped down on Auburn. War Eagle racked up 290 yards of offense in the first half. Defensive coordinator Dave Aranda and staff made the second half adjustments and from there allowed just 64 yards of offense and kept Auburn off the scoreboard. When we came in at halftime, that's all we had to do, tighten up those little plays and get, the, get that little thing just tightened up, screwed up, and we came back out, we were ready for those plays that they kept doing. Then, you know, we had to make them rely, make them a passer. You know, they're a running team, make them a pass, and nobody passes on us. The D kept LSU within a point of Auburn late in the fourth quarter. Connor Culp stepped on the field to try to give his squad the lead. LSU has had issues in the kicking game all season, but the kicker delivered from 42 yards out to give LSU a 23-21 lead. As soon as I hit the ball, I knew I, I made it. Before it even went through, I started celebrating a little bit. I think it jumped up in the air and um, started celebrating with my teammates. But... Um, it's definitely a moment I'll, I'll never forget. Culp added another field goal to push the advantage to four. And once the defense dashed any hopes of an Auburn comeback, the celebration began inside Tiger Stadium and continued into the night. We won two big games in a row. Uh, we're going to treat every opponent with respect, uh, treat every game as something that's very valuable to us as, as we did at the beginning of the season. Fight, scratch, and claw like Tigers like we know how to. Uh, we're going to enjoy this win. Right, number 10, El Minan. We do this. Hey, coming down Valley, you bound to lose. Don't... We'll go and watch the film, but we're going to get ready for our next opponent, just like we've been getting ready the last two weeks, and nothing's going to change. Talk about halftime adjustments. Check out the LSU defensive numbers against Auburn from the first half compared to the second half. Auburn did, did pretty much what it wanted to do in the first half, not the case in the second. For more on LSU's comeback win, I caught up with our friend Michael Cobble, sports director at WBRZ in Baton Rouge. When you saw that, that defensive performance, is it something they can build on? I think so. I mean, you saw a couple of different factors there, I think, win the day. LSU's getting healthier on the defensive line. I think that matters. They were able to stuff some of those Johnson runs that, you know, were getting broken on in the first half. They obviously stopped the screen plays that they learned from in the first half. But you also saw the secondary play a little bit better. Grant Delpit, uh, you know, making some plays where in the past you've seen that be susceptible. You know, some youngsters struggling. Well, I think LSU stepped up in that area. And certainly they stopped them on that final drive, you know, when they were, had to make the plays down the field. Dante coming up. Big. I know a lot of people have been critical about Danny Etling and his play at quarterback, but today he he, he performed well enough to, to act like he is a starting team. Um, what was your opinion of his performance? Yeah, I don't think it's good enough to win any major games. Uh, I think he's really struggling, you know, to, to find the, a rhythm in this offense. And I think that's the biggest challenge Matt Canada has now. Anything LSU did today, I think they did as, as a result of their special teams. They obviously, you know, flipped the field with their punts. They were able to, you know, down the ball with Russell Gage, you know, pinning Auburn deep uh, a couple of different times. And then, you know, DJ Sharks' big return, kind of getting this stadium back into this ball game when it was nip and tuck. So I think the, the offense still has some struggles, but we have to remember they are playing three freshmen on the offensive line, two true freshmen, one redshirt freshman. You did see a little bit more of Darius Geis. That was nice, but I think, you know, yeah, you're going to have to find what Danny Etling does and build on it because he has to complete some of these balls that aren't being completed right now. Do you think this could be one of those wins that propels this team to at least getting back on track or at least making this a, a successful season to LSU standards? I don't think this season is going to be successful to LSU standards, but I think it now has the opportunity to be better than anybody expected. No one thought LSU was going to beat Auburn here today, except maybe the guys in that locker room and some people that really just have the purple and gold glasses on. So I think that it is a nice victory for them, but it won't matter a lick if they don't come out and follow up on that in Oxford next week at Ole Miss. They have to win there because, you know, you can have a win, but if you come back and lay an egg, then you're really just, you know, shooting yourselves in the foot twice. So I think, you know, Alabama's still looming, but I think this gives this team enough confidence to say, all right, now we can beat Auburn, obviously. We can beat Ole Miss. We can beat Tennessee, Texas A&M, Arkansas, Alabama, really the only big block left on there that they have to hurdle. But, uh, you know, I think it gives them a shot in the arm for sure. And a lot of belief that, you know, maybe we're not as bad as we thought we were or as everyone else thinks we might be. 
The trip to Miami didn't go the way Tulane thought it would. A 14 point row favor against Florida International, plus coming off back to back wins, the Green Wave figured it would roll past the Panthers. But as Doug Mouton shows us, the Wave did not handle the success well. For Tulane, it's two steps forward, one step back. Saturday night was not a game junior quarterback Jonathan Banks wants to remember. He had one interception, one fumble lost, and just 36 yards passing. We throw the football, we got to do a good job with completions because they're big hitters for us. So we didn't complete those. But for Tulane, it was a complete loss. In the first half especially, the defense couldn't get off the field. Florida International controlled the ball for more than 19 minutes in the first two quarters. They came out and they had some wrinkles, uh, some things that we hadn't seen all week that they really confused us with. We had to make some, uh, a lot of halftime adjustments, so that was really what happened in the first quarter. It was a lot of adjusting. And the Green Wave never fully adjusted. And it's a tough pill to swallow for a team trying to get to six wins, trying to get bowl eligible. And this one was winnable. You can't sit around and pat yourself on the back when you play well. You can't dwell on the negatives either. You can't. Like this, we got to move on from this game too. And for Tulane, the schedule gets really difficult right now. The Green Wave host 16th ranked South Florida Saturday. The Bulls have won 11 straight dating back to last season. Then Tulane is at 25th ranked Memphis. That is a tough stretch. Doug Mouton, fourth down on four. Still ahead, Doug Mouton sits down with the advocate Scott Kushner to preview the Pelicans as the season gets started on Wednesday. Does this look like a playoff team? We'll answer that and much more when we come back. And welcome back to fourth down on four. Scott Kushner from our partners at The Advocate joins us. All right, the Pelicans open Wednesday in Memphis, the home opener Friday against Golden State. How much does the Rajon Rondo injury hurt, would you say? It's significant. Uh, I mean, they most of training camp, they talked about getting together and getting this group kind of you know, coalescing, and then you got an injury. And so now instead of uh, Drew Holiday knowing his role and knowing where he's going to be, he now is sort of in this in-between spot where he was a lot of last year. So... Who's he going to be playing with? Where's your backcourt going? All those kinds of things create uh, a discomfort that would not have been there if Rajon Rondo, not to mention just how good he is. No, no doubt. And Rondo can help you perimeter defense, but I think the biggest loss is that now Holiday has to play a lot more point guard. He was so much more effective last year. We saw off the ball. And Holiday Rondo are a nice defensive backcourt guarding the three-point line. You lose all of that for probably 20 games. Sure. And each one more is a solid two guard, you know, defensively. And Ian Clark is, is, is a fine backup as well. Uh, and what you're going to see a lot, and this is what Drew Holiday said, is that it doesn't change that much for him. Mm -hmm. You're going to see DeMarcus Cousins playing a lot on the ball. Mm -hmm. He was going to be taking it up a lot. He's mm -hmm. going to be standing at the top of the key with the ball, driving, dishing. You're going to see a lot more of that now that Rondo's not there. So that could actually help them in the long run, but that's kind of, you got to really be looking for a silver lining. Yeah. Uh, but you are going to see a lot of point boogie, as they call it. Yeah, no, no question about it. And look, that's a good thing. So much of the West is built on wings and point guards sure. that if you're going to try to win, why not win the opposite? And this team is so built, uh, other than Carl uh, Anthony Towns maybe, it's built so anti where the power of the West is. You're going to have twin towers against teams that don't play big ball at all yeah but the pelicans don't really play big ball either they've got two big guys they can do that and maybe for stretches they decide that's how they want to play when they think they can have a mismatch but a lot of times they're going to be playing fast mm -hmm. they're going to be playing all over the court and they're going to be you know moving at a speed in which doesn't you know this isn't the spurs with uh, david robinson <laughs> and tim duncan or, right. or you know ralph sampson and lakeem olajuwon right. this is a different looking set of, of seven footers so Interesting to see how Alvin Gentry and Chris Finch mesh in with those two big guys. It has not worked that great in preseason. I no, think. not yet, but we'll yeah. see. All right, look, Sports Illustrated's predictions came out a couple of days ago. They put the Pelicans 11th in the West. They say it is an atrocious bench. Is that a realistic prediction? I mean, look, they're eighth at best maybe, but how do you look at this season? What is a good finish, and what do you expect? So, first of all, the atrocious bench. 
you gotta if you look at five and five, yes, it's really bad. Mm -hmm. But that's not gonna be how it works. Sure. Marcus Cousins or Anthony Davis will be on the floor at all times. Right. So that really helps a lot mask that bench. As far as a realistic expectation, I think this team playoffs are bust. They mm -hmm. either get in the playoffs or everything has gone horribly wrong and they gotta pretty much fire everybody inside the organization. <laughs> it is very clear cut. It doesn't matter how many wins, it doesn't matter how many mm -hmm. losses, it doesn't matter how they look. You either get in the playoffs and everybody's okay, or you don't make the playoffs and everybody's gone. Yes or no? Will they get in the playoffs this year? Me personally? Yes. Nah. No, see, I'm leaning no, I and I feel bad about that, but it's how I'm leaning. Scott Cushion will be talking a lot during the basketball season. Again, it starts Wednesday night. We're back with more. Fourth down on four in a minute. That does it for fourth down on four. Thanks for joining us. For Doug Mouton, Andrew Dope, producer Danny Rockwell, and the rest of the Eyewitness Sports team, I'm Ricardo LeCompte. We'll see you back here next week. Goodbye.